Tom Sawyer, Chapter 31. Now to return to Tom and Becky's share in the picnic. They tripped along the murky aisles with the rest of the company, visiting the familiar wonders of the cave, wonders dubbed with rather over-descriptive names, such as the drawing room, the cathedral, Aladdin's palace, and so on. Presently, the hide-and-seek frolicking began, and Tom and Becky engaged in it with zeal until the exertion began to grow a trifle wearisome. Then they wandered down a sinuous avenue, holding their candles aloft and reading the tangled webwork of names, dates, post office addresses, and mottos with which the rocky walls had been frescoed in candle smoke. Still drifting along and talking, they scarcely noticed that they were now in a part of the cave whose walls were not frescoed. They smoked their own names under an overhanging shelf and moved on. Presently, they came to a place where a little stream of water, trickling over a ledge and carrying a limestone sediment with it, had, in slow-dragging ages, formed a laced and ruffled Niagara in gleaming and imperishable stone. Tom squeezed his small body behind it in order to illuminate it for Becky's gratification. He found that it curtained a sort of steep natural stairway which was enclosed between narrow walls, and at once the ambition to be a discoverer seized him. Becky responded to his call, and they made a smoke mark for future guidance and started upon their quest. They wound this way and that, far down into the secret depths of the cave, made another mark and branched off in search of novelties to tell the upper world about. In one place they found a spacious cavern from, from whose ceiling de depended a multitude of shining stalactites of the length and circumference of a man's leg. They walked all about it, wandering and admiring, and presently left it by one of the numerous passages that opened into it. This shortly brought them to a bewitching spring, whose basin was encrusted with a frostwork of glittering crystals. It was in the midst of a cavern whose walls were supported by many fantastic pillars which had been formed by the joining of great stalactites and stalagmites together, the result of the ceaseless water drip of centuries. Under the roof, vast knots of bats had packed themselves together, thousands in a bunch, the lights disturbed the creatures, and they came flocking down by hundreds, squeaking and darting furiously at the candles. Tom knew their ways and the danger of this sort of conduct. He seized Becky's hand and hurried her into the first corridor that offered, and none too soon, for a bat struck Becky's light out with its wing while she was passing out of the cavern. The bats chased the children a good distance, but the fugitives plunged into every new passage it offered, and at last got rid of the perilous things. Tom found a subterranean lake shortly, which stretched its dim length away until its shape was lost in the shadows. He wanted to explore its borders, but concluded that it would be best to sit down and rest a while first. Now, for the first time, the deep stillness of the place laid a clammy hand upon the spirits of the children. Becky said, Why, I didn't notice but it seems ever so long since I heard any of the others. Come to think, Becky, we are away down below them, and I don't know how far away north or south or east or whichever it is. We couldn't hear them here. Becky grew apprehensive. I wonder how long we've been down here, Tom. We better start back. Yes, I reckon we better. Perhaps we better. Can you find the way, Tom? It's all... A mixed up crookedness to me. I reckon I could find it, but then the bats. If they put out our candles, it will be an awful fix. Let's try some other way so as not to go through there. Well, but I hope we won't get lost. It would be so awful, said the, and the girl shuddered at the thought of the dreadful possibilities. They started through a corridor and traversed it in silence a long way glancing at each new opening to see if there was anything familiar about the look of it. But they were all strange. Every time Tom made an examination, Becky would watch his face for an encouraging sign. And he would say cheerily, 
Oh, it's all right. This ain't the one, but we'll come to it right away. But he felt less and less hopeful with each failure and presently began to turn off into diverging avenues at sheer random in desperate hope of finding the one that was wanted. He still said it was all right, but there was such a leaden dread at his heart that the words had lost their ring and sounded just as if he had said, all is lost. Becky clung to his side in an anguish of fear and tried hard to keep back the tears, but they would come. At last she said, oh, Tom, never mind the bats. Let's go back that way. We seem to get worse and worse off all the time. Listen, said he. Profound silence, silence so deep that even their breathings were conspicuous in the hush. Tom shouted. The call went echoing down the empty aisles and died out in the distance in a faint sound that resembled a ripple of mocking laughter. Oh, don't do it again, Tom. It's too horrid, said Becky. It is horrid, but I better, Becky. They might hear us, you know. And he shouted again. The might was an even a little a chillier horror than the ghostly laughter it so confessed a perishing hope the children stood still and listened but there was no result tom turned upon the back track at once and hurried his steps it was but a little while before a certain indecision in his manner revealed another fearful fact to becky he could not find his way back Oh, Tom, you didn't make any marks. Becky, I was such a fool, such a fool. I never thought we might want to come back. No, I can't find the way. It's all mixed up. Tom, Tom, we're lost, we're lost. We we'll never can get out of this awful place. Oh, why did we ever leave the others? She sank to the ground and burst into such a frenzy of crying that Tom was appalled with the idea that she might die or lose her reason. He sat down by her and put his arms around her. She buried her face in his bosom. She clung to him. She poured out her terror, her unavailing regrets, and the far echoes returned them all to jeering laughter. Tom begged her to pluck up hope again, and she said she could not. He fell to blaming and abusing himself for getting her into this miserable situation. This had a better effect. She said she would try to hope again. She would get up and follow wherever he might lead if only he would not talk like that any more. For he was no more to blame than she, she said. So they moved on again, aimlessly, simply at random. All they could do was to move, keep moving. For a little while, hope made a show of reviving, not with any reason to back it, but only because it is its nature to revive when the spring has not been taken out of it by age and familiarity with failure. By and by, Tom took Becky's candle and blew it out. This economy meant so much. Words were not needed. Becky understood, and her hope died again. She knew that Tom had a whole candle and three or four pieces in his pockets, yet he must economize. By and by, fatigue began to assert its claims. The children tried to pay attention, for it was dreadful to think of sitting down when time was grown to be so precious. Moving in some direction, in any direction, was at least progress and might bear fruit. But to sit down was to invite death and shorten its pursuit. At last, Becky's frail limbs refused to carry her farther. She sat down. Tom rested with her, and they talked of home and the friends there, and the comfortable beds, and above all, the light. Becky cried, and Tom tried to think of some way of comforting her. But all his encouragements were grown threadbare with use, and sounded like sarcasms. Fatigue bore so heavily upon Becky that she drowsed off to sleep. Tom was grateful. He sat looking into her drawn face and saw it grow smooth and natural under the influence of pleasant dreams, and by and by a smile dawned and rested there. The peaceful face reflected somewhat of peace and healing into his own spirit and his thoughts wandered away to bygone times and dreamy memories. 
While he was deep in his musings, Becky woke up with a breezy little laugh, but it was stricken dead upon her lips, and a groan followed it. Oh, how could I sleep? I wish I never, never had waked. No, no, I don't, Tom. Don't look so. I won't say it again. I'm glad you've slept, Becky. You'll feel rested now, and we'll find the way out. We can try, Tom, but I've seen such a beautiful country in my dream. I reckon we are going there. Maybe not, maybe not. Cheer up, Becky, and let's go on trying. They rose up and wandered along, hand in hand, and hopeless. They tried to estimate how long they had been in the cave, but all they knew was that it seemed days and weeks, and yet it was plain that this could not be, for their candles were not gone yet. A long time after this, they could not tell how long. Tom said they must go softly and listen for dripping water. They must find a spring. They found one presently, and Tom said it was time to rest again. Both were cruelly tired, yet Becky said she thought she could go a little farther. She was surprised to hear Tom dissent. She could not understand it. They sat down, and Tom fastened his candle to the wall in front of them with some clay. Thought it was soon busy. Nothing was said for some time. Then Becky broke the silence. Tom, I am so hungry. Tom took something out of his pocket. Do you remember this, he said. Becky almost smiled. It's our wedding cake, Tom. Yes, I wish it was as big as a barrel, for it's all we've got. I saved it from the picnic for us to dream on, Tom, the way grown-up people do with wedding cake. But it'll be our... She dropped the sentence where it was. Tom divided the cake, and Becky ate with good appetite, while Tom nibbled on his moiety. There was abundance of cold water to finish the feast with. By and by, Becky suggested that they move on again. Tom was silent a moment. Then he said, Becky, can you bear it if I tell you something? Becky's face paled, but she thought she could. Well then, Becky, we must stay here where there's water to drink. That little piece is our last candle. Becky gave loose to tears and wailings. Tom did what he could to comfort her, but with little effect. At length, Becky said, Tom! Well, Becky, they'll miss us and hunt for us. Yes, they will. Certainly they will. Maybe they're hunting for us now, Tom. Why, I reckon maybe they are. I hope they are. When would they miss us, Tom? When they get back to the boat, I reckon. Tom, it might be dark then. Would they notice we hadn't come? I don't know, but anyway, your mother would miss you as soon as they got home. A frightened look in Becky's face brought Tom to his senses, and he saw that he had made a blunder. Becky was not to have gone home that night. The children became silent and thoughtful. In a moment, a new burst of grief from Becky showed Tom that the thing in his mind had struck hers also that the Sabbath morning might be half spent before Mrs. Thatcher discovered that Becky was not at Mrs. Harper's. The children fastened their eyes upon their bit of candle and watched it melt slowly and pitifully away, saw the half inch of wick stand alone at last, saw the feeble flame rise and fall, climb into the thin column of smoke, linger at its top a moment, and then... The horror of utter darkness reigned. How long afterward it was that Becky came to a slow consciousness that she was crying in Tom's arms, neither could tell. All that they knew was that after what seemed a mighty stretch of time, both awoke out of a dead stupor of sleep and resumed their miseries once more. Tom said it might be Sunday now, maybe Monday. He tried to get Becky to talk, but her sorrows were too oppressive. All her hopes were gone. Tom said that they must have been missed long ago, and no doubt the search was going on. He would shout, and maybe someone would come. He tried it, but in the darkness the distant echo sounded so hideously that he tried it no more. 
The hours wasted away, and hunger came to torment the captives again. A portion of Tom's half of the cake was left. They divided and ate it. But they seemed hungrier than ever before. The poor morsel of food only whetted desire. By and by, Tom said, Shh, did you hear that? Both held their breath and listened. There was a sound like the faintest far-off shout. Instantly, Tom answered it, and leading Becky by the hand, started groping down the corridor in its direction. Presently, he listened again. Again, the sound was heard, and apparently a little nearer. It's them, said Tom. They're coming. Come along, Becky. We're all right now. The joy of the prisoners was almost overwhelming. Their speed was slow, however, because pitfalls were somewhat common and had to be guarded against. They shortly came to one and had to stop. It might be three feet deep. It might be a hundred. There was no passing it at any rate. Tom got down on his breast and reached as far down as he could. No bottom. They must stay there and wait until the searchers came. They listened. Evidently, the distant shoutings were growing more distant. A moment or two more, and they had gone altogether. The heart-sinking misery of it. Tom whooped until he was hoarse, but it was of no use. He talked hopefully to Becky. But an age of anxious waiting passed, and no sounds came again. The children groped their way back to the spring. The weary time dragged on. They slept again, and awoke famished and woe-stricken. Tom believed it must be Tuesday by this time. Now an idea struck him. There were some side passages near at hand. It would be better to explore some of these than bear the weight of the heavy time in idleness. He took a kite line from his pocket, tied it to a projection, and he and Becky started, Tom in the lead, unwinding the line as he groped along. At the end of twenty steps, the corridor ended in a jumping-off place. Tom got down on his knees and felt below, and then, as far around the corner as he could reach with his hands conveniently, he made an effort to stretch yet a little farther to the right. And in that moment, not twenty yards away, a human hand holding a candle appeared from behind a rock. Tom lifted up a glorious shout, and instantly that hand was followed by the body it belonged to. Injun Joe's! Tom was paralyzed. He could not move. He was vastly gratified the next moment to see the Spaniard take to his heels and get himself out of sight. Tom wondered that Joe had not recognized his voice and come over and killed him for testifying in court. But the echoes must have disguised the voice. Without doubt, that was it, he reasoned. Tom's fright weakened every muscle in his body. He said to himself that if he had strength enough to get back to the spring, he would stay there and nothing should tempt him to run the risk of meeting Injun Joe again. He was careful to keep Becky what who, what it was he had seen. He told her he had only shouted for luck. But hunger and wretchedness rise superior to fears in the long run. Another tedious wait at the spring and another long sleep brought changes. The children awoke tortured with a raging hunger. Tom believed that it must be Wednesday or Thursday or even Friday or Saturday now and that the search had been given over. He proposed to explore another passage. He felt willing to risk Injun Joe and all other terrors, but Becky was very weak. She had sunk into a dreary apathy and would not be roused. She said she would wait now where she was and die. It would not be long. She told Tom to go with the kite line and explore if he chose, but she implored him to come back every little while and speak to her and she made him promise that when the awful time came, he would stay by her and hold her hand until all was over. Tom kissed her with a choking sensation in his throat and made a show of being confident of finding the searchers or an escape from the cave. Then he took the kite line in his hand and went groping down one of the passages on his hands and knees, distressed with hunger and sick with bodings, 
of coming doom. Tom Sawyer, Chapter 32 Tuesday afternoon came and waned to the twilight. The village of St. Petersburg still mourned. The lost children had not been found. Public prayers had been offered up for them, and many and many a private prayer that had the petitioner's whole heart in it. But still no good news came from the cave. The majority of the searchers had given up the quest and gone back to their daily avocations, saying that it was plain the children could never be found. Mrs. Thatcher was very ill and a great part of the time delirious. People said it was heartbreaking to hear her call her child and raise her head and listen a whole minute at a time, then lay it wearily down again with a moan. Aunt Polly had drooped into a settled melancholy, and her gray hair had grown almost white. The village went to its rest on Tuesday night, sad and forlorn. Away in the middle of the night, a wild peal burst from the village bells, and in a moment the streets were swarming with frantic, half-clad people who shouted, Turn out! Turn out! They've been found! They're found! Tin pans and horns were added to the din. The population massed itself and moved toward the river, met the children coming in an open carriage, drawn by shouting citizens, thronged around it, joined its homeward march, and swept magnificently up the main street, roaring huzzah after huzzah. The village was illuminated. Nobody went to bed again. It was the greatest night the little town had ever seen. During the first half hour, a procession of villagers filed through Judge Thatcher's house, seized the saved ones, and kissed them, squeezed Mrs. Thatcher's hand, tried to speak but couldn't, and drifted out, raining tears all over the place. Aunt Polly's happiness was complete, and Mrs. Thatcher's nearly so. It would be complete, however, as soon as the messenger dispatched with the great news to the cave should get the word to her husband. Tom lay upon a sofa with an eager auditory about him and told the history of the wonderful adventure, putting in many striking additions to adorn it withal, and closed with a description of how he left Becky and went on an exploring expedition how he followed two avenues as far as his kite line would reach, how he followed a third to the fullest stretch of his kite line and was about to turn back when he glimpsed a far-off speck that looked like daylight, dropped the line and groped toward it, pushed his head and shoulders through a small hole and saw the broad Mississippi rolling by. And if it had only happened to be night, he would not have seen that speck of daylight and would not have explored that passage any more. He told how he went back for Becky and broke the good news, and she told him not to fret her with such stuff, for she was tired and knew she was going to die and wanted to. 
He described how he labored with her and convinced her and how she almost died for joy when she had groped to where she actually saw the blue speck of daylight, how he pushed his way out at the hole and then helped her out, how they sat there and cried for gladness, how some men came along in a skiff and Tom hailed them and told them their situation and their famished condition, how the men didn't believe the wild tale at first because, they said, you are five miles down the river below the valley the cave is in. Then took them aboard, rode to a house, gave them supper, made them rest till two or three hours after dark, and then brought them home. Before day dawn, Judge Thatcher and the handful of searchers with him were tracked out in the cave by the twine clues they had strung behind them and informed of the great news. Three days and nights of toil and hunger in the cave were not to be shaken off at once, as Tom and Becky soon discovered. They were bedridden all of Wednesday and Thursday and seemed to grow more and more tired and worn all the time. Tom got about a little on Thursday, was down Friday, and nearly as whole as ever Saturday. But Becky did not leave her room until Sunday, and then she looked as if she had passed through a wasting illness. Tom learned of Huck's sickness and went to see him on Friday, but could not be admitted to the bedroom. Neither could he on Saturday or Sunday. He was admitted daily after that, but was warned to keep still about his adventure and introduce no exciting topic. The widow Douglas stayed by to see that he obeyed. At home, Tom learned of the Cardiff Hill event, also that the ragged man's body had eventually been found in the river near the ferry landing. He had been drowned while trying to escape, perhaps. After a fortnight, about a fortnight after Tom's rescue from the cave, he started off to visit Huck, who had grown plenty strong enough now to hear exciting talk, and Tom had some that would interest him, he thought. Judge Thatcher's house was on Tom's way, and he stopped to see Becky. The judge and some friends set Tom to talking, and someone asked him ironically if he wouldn't like to go to the cave again. Tom said he thought he wouldn't mind it. The judge said, well, there are others just like you, Tom. I've not the least doubt, but we have taken care of that. Nobody will get lost in that cave anymore. Why? Because I had its big door sheathed with a boiler iron two weeks ago and triple locked, and I've got the keys. Tom turned as white as a sheet. What's the matter, boy? Here, run somebody. Fetch a glass of water. The water was brought and thrown into Tom's face. Ah, now you're all right. What was the matter with you, Tom? Oh, Judge, Injun Joe's in the cave. Tom Sawyer, Chapter 33. Within a few minutes, the news had spread and a dozen skiff loads of men were on their way to MacDougall's cave, and the ferry boat, well filled with passengers, soon followed. Tom Sawyer was in the skiff that bore Judge Thatcher. When the cave door was unlocked, a sorrowful sight presented itself in the dim twilight of the place. Injun Joe lay stretched upon the ground. 
dead, with his face close to the crack of the door, as if his longing eyes had been fixed to the latest moment upon the light and the cheer of the free world outside. Tom was touched, for he knew by his own experience how this wretch had suffered. His pity was moved, but nevertheless he felt an abounding sense of relief and security now, which revealed to him in a degree which he had not fully appreciated before how vast a weight of dread had been lying upon him since the day he lifted his voice against this bloody-minded outcast. Injun Joe's bowie knife lay close by, its blade broken in two. The great foundation beam of the doors had been chipped and hacked through with tedious labor, useless labor too. It was for the native rock formed a sill outside it and upon that stubborn material the knife had wrought no effect. The only damage done was to the knife itself. But if there had been no stony obstruction there, the labor would have been useless still. For if the beam had been wholly cut away, Injun Joe could not have squeezed his body under the door, and he knew it. So he had only hacked that place in order to keep in order to keep something, in order to pass the weary time, in order to employ his tortured faculties. Ordinarily, one could find half a dozen bits of candles stuck around in the crevices of this vestibule, left there by tourists, but there were none now. The prisoner had searched them out and eaten them. He had also contrived to catch a few bats, and these also he had eaten, leaving only their claws. The poor unfortunate had starved to death. In one place near at hand, a stalagmite had been slowly growing up from the ground for ages, builded by the water drip from a stalactite overhead. The captive had broken off the stalagmite, and upon the stump had placed a stone, wherein he had scooped a shallow hollow to catch the precious drop that fell once in every three minutes, with the dreary regularity of a clock tick. A dessert spoonful, once in four and twenty hours. That drop was falling when the pyramids were new, when Troy fell, when the foundations of Rome were laid, when Christ was crucified, when the conqueror created the British empires, when Columbus sailed, when the massacre at Lexington was news. It is falling now. It will still be falling when all these things shall have sunk down the afternoon of history and the twilight of tradition and been swallowed up in the thick night of oblivion. Has everything a purpose and a mission? Did this drop fall patiently during 5,000 years to be ready for this flitting human insect's need? And has it another important object to accomplish 10,000 years to come? No matter. It is many and many a year since the hapless half-breed scooped out the stone to catch the priceless drops. But to this day the tourist stares longest at that pathetic stone and that slow-dropping water when he comes to see the wonders of MacDougall's cave. Injun Joe's cup stands first in the list of the cavern's marvels. Even Aladdin's palace cannot rival it. Injun Joe was buried near the mouth of the cave, and people flocked there in boats and wagons from the towns and from all the farms and hamlets for seven miles around. They brought their children and all sorts of provisions and confessed that they had almost as satisfactory a time at the funeral as they would have had at the hanging. This funeral stopped the further growth of one thing, the petition to the governor for Injun Joe's pardon. The petition had been largely signed, Many tearful and eloquent meetings had been held, and a committee of sappy women had been appointed to go in deep mourning and wail around the governor and implore him to be a merciful and, tramp and trample his duty underfoot. Injun Joe was believed to have killed five citizens of the village, but what of that? If he had been Satan himself, there would have been plenty of weaklings ready to scribble their names to a pardon petition and drop a tear on it from their permanently impaired and leaky waterworks. 
The morning after the funeral, Tom took Huck to a private place to have an important talk. Huck had learned all about Tom's adventure from the Welshman and the widow Douglas by this time, but Tom said he reckoned there was one thing they had not told him. That thing that was what he wanted to talk about now. Huck's face saddened. He said, I know what it is. You got into number two and never found anything but whiskey. Nobody told me it was you, but I just knowed it must have been you soon as I heard about that whiskey business. And I known you hadn't got the money because you'd got at me some way or other and told me even if you was mum to everybody else. Tom, something's always told me we'd never get hold of that swag. Why, Huck, I never told on that tavern keeper. You know his tavern was all right the Saturday I went to the picnic. Don't you remember you was to watch there that night? Oh, yes. Why, it seems about a year ago. It was that very night I followed Injun Joe to the Witters. You followed him? Yes, but you keep mum. I reckon Injun Joe's left friends behind him, and I don't want him souring on me and doing me mean tricks. If it hadn't been for me, he'd be down in Texas now, all right. Then Huck told his entire adventure with confidence to Tom, who had only heard the Welshman's part of it before. Well, said Huck presently, coming back to the main question, whoever nipped the whiskey in number two who nipped the money too, I reckon. Anyway, it's a goner for us, Tom. Huck, that money wasn't ever in number two. What? Huck searched his comrade's face keenly. Tom, have you got on the track of that money again? Huck, it's in the cave. Huck's eyes blazed. Say it again, Tom. The money's in the cave. Tom, honest engine now? Is it fun or earnest? Earnest, Huck. Just as earnest as I ever was in my life. Will you go in there with me and help get it out? I bet I will. I will if it's where we can blaze our way to it and not get lost. Huck, we can do that without the least little bit of trouble in the world. Good as wheat. What makes you think the money's... Huck, you just wait until we get in there. If we don't find it, I'll agree to give you my drum and everything I've got in the world. I will, by jings. All right, it's a whiz. When do you say? Right now, if you say it. Are you strong enough? Is it far to the cave? I've been on my pins a little, three or four days now, but I can't walk more than a mile, Tom. At least I don't think I could. It's about five mile to there, into there, the, the way anybody but me would go. Huck, there's a mighty shortcut that they don't know anybody but me know about. Huck, I'll take you right to it in a skiff. I'll float the skiff down there and I'll pull it back again all by myself. You needn't ever turn your head over. Let's start right off, Tom. All right. We want some bread and meat and our pipes and a little bag or two and two or three kite strings and some of these newfangled things they call Lucifer matches. I tell you, many's the time I wished I had some when I was in there before. A trifle afternoon, the boys borrowed a small skiff from a citizen who was absent and got under way at once. When they were several miles below Cave Hollow, Tom said, Now you see this bluff here looks all alike all the way down from the Cave Hollow? No houses, no wood yards, bushes, all alike. But do you see that white place up yonder where there's been a landslide? Well, that's one of my marks. We'll get ashore now. They landed. Now, Huck, where we're a-standin', you could touch that hole I got out of with a fishing pole. See if you can find it. Huck searched all the place about and found nothing. Tom proudly marched into a thick clump of sumac bushes and said, Here you are. Look at it, Huck. It's the snuggest hole in the country. You just keep mum about it. All along I've been wanting to be a robber, but I knew I've got to have a thing like this and where to run across it was the bother. We've got it now, and we'll keep it quiet. Only we'll let Joe Harper and Ben Rogers in, because of course there's got to be a gang, or else there wouldn't be any style about it. Tom Sawyer's gang. 
It sounds splendid, don't it, Huck? Well, it just does, Tom. And who'll we rob? Oh, most anybody. Waylay people, that's mostly the way. And kill them? No, not always. Hide them in the cave till they raise a ransom. What's a ransom? Money. You make them raise all they can, often their friends. And after you've kept them a year, if it rain, ain't raised but then, you kill them. That's the general way. Only you don't kill the women. You shut up the women, but you don't kill them. They're always beautiful and rich and awfully scared. You take their watches and things, but you always take your hat off and talk polite. They ain't anybody as polite as robbers. You'll see that in any book. Well, the women get to loving you, and after they've been in the cave a week or two weeks, they stop crying, and after that, you couldn't get them to leave. If you drove them out, they'd turn right around and come back. It's so in all the books. Why, it's real bully, Tom. I believe it's better to be a pirate. Yes, it's better in some ways because it's close to home and circuses and all that. By this time, everything was ready and the boys entered the hole. Tom in the lead. They toiled their way to the farthest end of the tunnel, then made their spliced kite strings fast and moved on. A few steps brought them to the spring, and Tom felt a shudder quiver all through him. He showed Huck the fragment of candle wick perched on a lump of clay against the wall and described how he and Becky had watched the flames struggle and expire. The boys began to quiet down to whispers now, for the stillness and gloom of the place oppressed their spirits. They went on and presently entered and followed Tom's other corridor until they reached the jumping-off place. The candles revealed the fact that it was not really a precipice, but only a steep clay hill twenty or thirty feet high. Tom whispered, Now I'll show you something, Huck. He held his candle aloft and said, Look far around the corner as you can. Do you see that? There, on the big rock over yonder, done with candle smoke. Tom, it's a cross. Now, where's your number two? Under the cross, hey? Right yonder's where I saw Injun Joe poke up his candle, Huck. Huck stared at the mystic sign a while and then said with a shaky voice, Tom, Let's get out of here. What? And leave the treasure? Yes. Leave it. Injun Joe's ghost is round about there, certain. No, it ain't, Huck. No, it ain't. It would haunt the place where he died, away out at the mouth of the cave, five mile from here. No, Tom, it wouldn't. It would hang around the money. I know the ways of ghosts, and so do you. Tom began to fear that Huck was right. Misgivings gathered in his mind, but presently an idea occurred to him. Looky here, Huck, what fools we're making of ourselves. Injun Joe's ghost ain't a-goin' to come around where there's a cross. The point was well taken. It had its effect. Tom, I didn't think of that, but that's so. It's luck for us, that cross is. I reckon we'll climb down there and have a hunt for that box. Tom went first, cutting rude steps into the clay hill as he descended. Huck followed. Four avenues opened out of the small cavern which the great rocks stood in. The boys examined three of them with no results. They found a small recess in the one nearest the base of the rock, with a pallet of blankets spread down in it. Also, an old suspender, some bacon rind, and the well-gnawed bones of two or three fowls. But there was no money box. The lad searched and researched this place, but in vain, Tom said, he said, under the cross. Well, this comes nearest to being under the cross. It can't be under the rock itself, because that's set solid on the ground. They searched everywhere once more, and then sat down discouraged. Huck could suggest nothing. By and by, Tom said, looky here, Huck. There's footprints and some candle grease on the clay above about one side of this rock, but not on the other sides. Now, what's that for? I bet you the money is under the rock. I'm going to dig in the clay. That ain't no bad notion, Tom, Huck said with animation. 
Tom's real Barlow was out at once, and he had not dug four inches before he struck wood. Hey, Huck, you hear that? Huck began to dig and scratch now. Some boards were soon uncovered and removed. They had concealed a natural chasm which led under the rock. Tom got into this and held his candle as far under the rock as he could, but he said he could not see to the end of the rift. He proposed to explore. He stooped and passed under. The narrow way descended gradually. He followed its winding course, first to the right, then to the left, Huck at his heels. Tom turned a short curve by and by and exclaimed, My goodness, Huck, looky here! It was the treasure box, sure enough, occupying a snug little cavern, along with an empty powder keg, a couple of guns in leather cases, two or three pairs of old moccasins, a leather belt, and some other rubbish well soaked with the water drop drip. Got it at last, said Huck, plowing among the tarnished coins in his hands. My, but we're rich, Tom. Huck, I always reckoned we'd get it. It's just too good to believe, but we have got it. Sh sure, say, Let's not fool around here. Let's snake it out. Let me see if I can lift the box. It weighed about 50 pounds. Tom could lift it after an awkward fashion, but could not carry it conveniently. I thought so, he said. They carried it like it was heavy that day in, at the haunted house. I noticed that. I reckoned I was right to think of fetching this little bags along. The money was soon in the bags, and the boys took it up to the cross rock. Now, let's fetch the guns and things, said Huck. No, Huck, leave them there. They're just the tricks to have when we go to robbing. We'll keep them there all the time, and we'll hold our orgies there, too. It's an awful snug place for orgies. What orgies? I don't know, but robbers always have orgies, and of course, we have to move them, too. We have to have them, too. Come along, Huck. We've been in here a long time. It's getting late, I reckon. I'm hungry, too. We'll eat and smoke when we get back to the skiff. They presently emerged into the clump of sumac bushes and looked warily out, found the coast clear, and were soon lunching and smoking in the skiff. As the sun dipped toward the horizon, they pushed out and got under way. Tom skimmed up the shore through the long twilight chatting cheerily with Huck, and landed shortly after dark. Now, Huck, said Tom, we'll hide the money in the loft of the widow's woodshed, and I'll come up in the morning and we'll count it out and divide it. Then we'll hunt up a place out in the woods for it where it will be safe. Just you lay quiet here and watch the stuff till I run and hook Benny Taylor's little wagon. I won't be gone a minute. He disappeared and presently returned with the wagon put the two small sacks into it, threw some old rags on top of them, and started off, dragging his cargo behind him. When the boys reached the Welshman's house, they stopped to rest. Just as they were about to move on, the Welshman stepped out and said, Hello, who's that? Huck and Tom Sawyer. Good, come along with me, boys. You are keeping everybody waiting. Here, hurry up, trot ahead. I'll haul the wagon for you. Why, it's not as light as it might be. Got bricks in it? Or old metal? Old metal, said Tom. I judge so. The boys in this town will take more trouble and fool away more time hunting up six bits worth of old iron to sell to the foundry than they would to make twice the money at regular work. But that's human nature. Hurry along, hurry along. The boys wanted to know what the hurry was about. Never mind, you'll see when we get to the widow Douglas's, Huck said with some apprehension, for he was long used to being falsely accused. Mr. Jones, we haven't been doing nothing. The Welshman laughed. Well, I don't know, Huck, my boy, I don't know about that. Ain't you and the widow good friends? Yes, well, she's been good friends to me anyway. All right then. What do you want to be afraid for? This question was not entirely answered in Huck's slow mind before he found himself pushed along with Tom into Mrs. Douglas's drawing room. 
Mr. Jones left the wagon near the door and followed. The place was grandly lighted and everybody that was of any consequence in the village was there. The Thatchers were there, the Harpers, the Rogerses, Aunt Polly, Sid, Mary, the minister, the editor, and a great many more, and all dressed in their best. The widow received the boys as heartily as any one could well receive two such looking beings. They were covered with clay and candle grease. Aunt Polly blushed crimson with humiliation and frowned and shook her head at Tom. Nobody suffered half as much as the two boys did, however. Mr. Jones said, Tom wasn't at home yet, so I gave him up, but I stumbled on him and Huck right at my door, and so I just brought them along in a hurry. And you did just right, said the widow. Come with me, boys. She took them to a bedchamber and said, Now wash and dress yourselves. Here are two new suits of clothes, shirts, socks, everything complete. They're Huck's. No, no thanks, Huck. Mr. Jones bought one and I the other. But they'll fit both of you. Get into them. We'll wait. Come down when you are slicked up enough. Then she left. Tom Sawyer, Chapter 34. Huck said, Tom, we can slope if we can find a rope. The window ain't high from the ground. Shucks, what do you want to slope for? Well, I ain't used to that kind of a crowd. I can't stand it. I ain't going down there, Tom. Oh, bother. It ain't anything. I don't mind it a bit. I'll take care of you. Sid appeared. Tom, he said, Auntie has been waiting for you all afternoon. Mary got your Sunday clothes ready, and everybody's been fretting about you. Say, ain't this grease and clay on your clothes? Now, Mr. City, you just tend to your own business. What's all this blowout about, anyway? It's one of the widow's parties that she's always having. This time it's for the Welshman and his sons on account of that scrape they helped her out of the other night. And say, I can tell you something if you want to know. Well, what? Why, Mr. Jones is going to try to spring something on the people here tonight, but I overheard him tell Auntie today about it as a secret, but I reckon it's not much of a secret now. Everybody knows. The widow, too, for all she tries to let on, she don't. Mr. Jones was bound Huck should be here. Couldn't get along with, a, with his grand secret without Huck, you know. Secret about what, Sid? about Huck tracking the robbers to the widows. I reckon Mr. Jones was going to make a grand time over his surprise, but I bet you it will drop pretty flat. Sid chuckled in a very contented and satisfied way. Sid, was it you that told? Oh, never mind who it was. Somebody told. That's enough. 
Sid, there's only one person in this town mean enough to do that, and that's you. If you had been in Huck's place, you'd have sneaked down the hill and never told anybody on the robbers. You can't do any but mean things, and you can't bear to see anybody praised for doing good ones. There, no thanks, as the widow says, and Tom cuffed Sid's ears and helped him to the door with several kicks. Now go and tell Auntie if you dare, and tomorrow you'll catch it. Some minutes later, the widow's guests were at the supper table, and a dozen children were propped up at little side tables in the same room after a fashion of that country and that day. At the proper time, Mr. Jones made his little speech in which he thanked the widow for the honor she was doing himself and his sons, but said there was another person whose modesty, and so forth and so on. He sprung his secret about Huck's share in the adventure in the finest dramatic manner he was master of, but the surprise it occasioned was largely counterfeit and not as clamorous and effusive as it might have been under happier circumstances. However, the widow made a pretty fair show of astonishment and heaped so many compliments and so much gratitude upon Huck that he almost forgot the nearly intolerable discomfort of his new clothes in the entirely intolerable discomfort of being set up as a target for everybody's gaze and everybody's laudations. The widow said she meant to give Huck a home under her roof and have him educated, and that when she could spare the money, she would start him in business in a modest way. Tom's chance would come. He said, Huck don't need it. Huck's rich. Nothing but a heavy strain upon the good manners of the company kept back the due and proper complimentary laugh at this pleasant joke. But the silence was a little awkward. Tom broke in. Huck's got money. Maybe you don't believe it, but he's got lots of it. Oh, you don't needn't smile. I reckon I can show you. You just wait a minute. Tom ran out of doors. The company looked at each other with perplexed interest and inquiringly at Huck, who was tongue-tied. Sid, what ails Tom, said Aunt Polly. He, well, there ain't ever any making of that boy out. I never, Tom entered, struggling with the weight of his sacks, and Aunt Polly did not finish her sentence. Tom poured the mass of yellow coin upon the table and said, There, what did I tell you? Half of it's Huck's and half of it's mine. The spectacle took the general breath away. All gazed. Nobody spoke for a moment. Then there was a unanimous call for explanation. Tom said he could furnish it, and he did. The tale was long, but brimful of interest. There was scarcely an interruption from anyone to break the charm of its flow. When he had finished, Mr. Jones said, I thought I had fixed up a little surprise for this occasion, but it don't amount to anything now. This one makes it seem mighty small, I'm willing to allow. The money was counted. The sum amounted to a little over $12,000. It was more than any one person had ever seen at one time before, though several persons were there whose worth was considerably more than that in property.
Tom Sawyer, Chapter 35 The reader may rest satisfied that Tom's and Huck's windfall made a mighty stir in the poor little village of St. Petersburg. So vast a sum, all in actual cash, seemed next to incredible. It was talked about, gloated over, glorified, until the reason of many of the citizens tottered under the strain of the unhealthy excitement. Every haunted house in St. Petersburg and the neighboring villages was dissected plank by plank and its foundations dug up and ransacked for hidden treasure. And not by boys, but men, pretty grave, unromantic men too, some of them. Whenever Tom and Huck appeared, they were courted, admired, stared at. The boys were not able to remember that their, re that their remarks had possessed weight before. But now their sayings were treasured and repeated. Everything they did seemed somehow to be regarded as remarkable. They had evidently lost the power of doing and staying, saying commonplace things. Moreover, their past history was raked up and discussed to bear marks of conspicuous originality. The village paper published biographical sketches of the boys. The widow Douglas put Huck's money out at 6%, and Judge Thatcher did the same with Tom's at Aunt Polly's request. Each lad had an income, now that was simply prodigious, a dollar for every weekday in the year and half of the Sundays. It was just what the minister got. No, it was what he was promised. He generally couldn't collect it. A dollar and a quarter a week would board, lodge, and school a boy in those old simple days, and clothe him and wash him too, for that matter. Judge Thatcher had conceived a great opinion of Tom. He said that no commonplace boy would ever have got his daughter out of the cave. When Becky told her father, in strict confidence, how Tom had taken her whipping at school, the judge was visibly moved, and when she pleaded grace for the mighty lie which Tom had told in order to shift that whipping from her shoulders to his own, the judge said with a fine outburst that it was a noble, a generous, a magnanimous lie, a lie that was worthy to hold up its head and march down through history, breast abreast with George Washington's lauded truth about the hatchet. Becky thought her father had never looked so tall and so superb as when he walked the floor and stamped his foot and said that. She went straight off and told Tom about it. Judge Thatcher hoped to see Tom a great lawyer or a great soldier some day. He said he meant to look to it that Tom should be admitted to the National Military Academy and afterward trained in the best law school in the country in order that he might be ready for either career or both. Huck Finn's wealth and the fact that he was now under Widow Douglas's protection introduced him into society. No, dragged him into it, hurled him into it, and his sufferings were almost more than he could bear. The widow's servants kept him clean and neat, combed and brushed, and they bedded him nightly in unsympathetic sheets that had not one little spot or stain which he could press to his heart and know for a friend. He had to eat with a knife and fork. He had to use napkin, cup, and plate. He had to learn his book. He had to go to church. He had to talk so properly that speech becomes insipid in his mouth. With air soever, he turned to the the bars and shackles of civilization shut him in and bound him hand and foot. He bravely bore his miseries three weeks, and then one day turned up missing. For 48 hours the widow hunted for him everywhere in great distress. The public were profoundly concerned. They searched high and low. They dragged the river for his body. Early on the third morning, Tom Sawyer wisely went poking among some old empty hogsheads down behind the abandoned slaughterhouse, and in one of them he found the refugee. Huck had slept there. He had just breakfasted upon some stolen odds and ends of food, and was lying off now in comfort with his pipe. He was unkempt, uncombed, and clad in the same old ruin of rags that had made him picturesque in the days when he was free and happy. Tom routed him out, told him the trouble he had been causing, and urged him to go home. 
Huck's face lost its tranquil content and took a melancholy cast. He said, don't talk about it, Tom. I've tried and it don't work. It don't work, Tom. It ain't for me. I ain't used to it. The widder's good to me and friendly, but I can't stand them ways. She makes me get up just at the same time every morning. She makes me wash. They comb me all the thunder. She wouldn't let me sleep in the woodshed. I got to wear them blamed clothes that just smothers me, Tom. And they don't seem any air get through them somehow, and they're so rotten nice that I can't sit down nor lay down nor roll around anywhere. I ain't slid on a cellar door for, well, it appears to be years. I got to go to church and sweat and sweat. I hate them ornery sermons. I can't catch a fly in there. I can't chaw. I got to wear shoes all Sunday. The wetter e witter eats by a bell. She goes to bed by a bell. She gets up by a bell. Everything's so awful regular, a body can't stand it. Well, everybody does it that way, Huck. Tom, it don't make any no difference. I ain't everybody, and I can't stand it. It's awful to be tied up so, and grub comes too easy. I don't take no interest in vittles that way. I got to ask to go fishing. I got to ask to go in a swimming. Durned if I ain't got to ask to do everything. Well, I've got to talk so nice it wasn't no comfort. I'd got to go up in the attic and rip out a while every day just to get a taste in my mouth. And I'd have died, Tom. The widder wouldn't let me smoke. She wouldn't let me yell. She wouldn't let me gape, not stretch nor scratch before folks. Then, with a spasm of special irritation and injury, and Dad fetch it, she prayed all the time. I never see such a woman. I had to shove, Tom. I just had to. Besides, that school's going to open. And I'd have had to go to it. Well, I wouldn't stand for that, Tom. Looky here, Tom. Being rich ain't what it's cracked up to be. It's just worry and worry and sweat and sweat and a wishin' you was dead all the time. Now these clothes suit me, and this barrel suits me, and I ain't ever going to shake em any more. Tom, I wouldn't ever got into all this trouble if it hadn't have been for that money, and now you just take my share of it along with yourn and give me a ten cent sometime, not many times, because I don't have a dern for a thing, thought it's tolerable hard to get, and you go and beg off for me with the widder. Oh, Huck, you know I can't do that. Tain't fair. And besides, if you'll try this thing just a while longer, you'll come to like it. Like it? Yes, the way I like a hot stove if I was to set on it long enough. No, Tom, I won't be rich, and I won't live in them cussed up smothery houses. I like the woods and the river and hogsheads, and I'll stick to them, too. Blame it all? It's just as we've got guns in a cave and all fixed up to rob. Here this darn foolishness has got to come up and spile it all. Tom saw his opportunity. Looky here, Huck. Being rich ain't going to keep me back from turning robber. No? Oh, good licks. Are you in real deadwood earnest, Tom? Just as dead earnest as I'm sitting here. But, Huck. We can't let you into the gang if you ain't respectable, you know. Huck's jaw was quenched. Can't let me in, Tom? Didn't you let me go for a pirate? Yes, but that's different. A robber is more high-toned than what a pirate is, as a general thing. In most countries, they're awful high up on the nobility, dukes and such. Now... Tom, ain't you always been friendly to me? You wouldn't shut me out, would you, Tom? You wouldn't do that now, would you, Tom? Huck, I wouldn't want to, and I don't want to. But what would people say? Why, they'd say, hmm, Tom Sawyer's gang, pretty low characters in it. They'd mean you, Huck. You wouldn't like that, and I wouldn't. Huck was silent for some time, engaged in a mental struggle. Finally, he said, Well, I'll go back to the widder for a month and tackle it and see if I can come to stand it if you'll let me belong to the gang, Tom. 
All right, Huck, that's, it's a whiz. Come along, old chap, and I'll ask the widow to let up on you a little, Huck. Will you, Tom? Now, will you? That's good. If she'll let up on some of the roughest things, I'll smoke private and cuss private and crowd through or bust. When are you going to start the gang and turn robbers? Oh, right off. We'll get the boys together and have the initiation tonight, maybe. Have the which? Have the initiation. What's that? It's to swear to stand by one another and never tell the gang secrets, even if you're chopped all the flinders and kill anybody in all his family that hurts one of the gang. That's gay. That's mighty gay, Tom, I'll tell ya. Ah, uh, well, I bet it is. And all that swearing's got to be done at midnight or in the lonesomest, awfulest place you can find. Haunted house is the best. But they're all ripped up now. Well, midnight's good anyway, Tom. Yes, so it is. And you've got to swear on a coffin and sign it with blood. Now that's something like. Why, it's a million times bullier than pirating. I'll stick to the witter until I rot, Tom. And if I get to be a regular ripper of a robber and everybody's talking about it, I reckon she'll be proud she snaked me in out of the wet. Conclusion so ended this chronicle. It being strictly a history of a boy, it must stop here. The story could not go much further without becoming a history of a man. When one writes a novel about grown people, he knows exactly where to stop. That is, with a marriage. But when he writes of juveniles, he must stop where he best can. Most of the characters that perform in this book still live and are prosperous and happy. Some day it may seem worthwhile to take up the story of the younger ones again and see what sort of men and women they turned out to be. Therefore, it will be wisest not to reveal any of that part of their lives at present. The End